going to show us how to get Scala to work in IntelliJ today. I did a quick demo of it um, in the last lecture. If there are still questions about it, maybe I'll run through a demo um, after lecture. And actually, I do think I have... Uh, there is a demo today. I forget exactly what it is, to be honest. Did I do one? I did, uh, I did 115 there instead of 116. Um, I think we're, we're kind of beyond the syllabus. So I'll start collapsing this one thing I, before we get started, I won't put this in the actual lecture, but, uh, something I forgot to mention when I was talking about the learning objectives, your entire goal of this course to pass, uh, ignoring the application objectives for now, but for the learning objectives is to convince me that you've completed all 15 of these bullet points. So I, we have the basic structure. Since there's 230 of you, we have to have some streamlined uh, way to do this, to mark these off. And that's where lecture questions, interviews, labs all come into play. So you can get these marked off in a more streamlined way. But in when it comes down to it, your goal is to convince me, a human being who can think and reason about things, that you've completed all 15 of these things. Uh, so if you are not able to complete the assignments, but you do, you actually can complete all these, I'll give you some way to be able to prove that to me. And you can show me by other means. Uh, and on the other hand, if you are able to complete the things that are part of the course, but I'm not convinced that you actually completed these things because you actually haven't, then, you know, that's uh, not going to bode well for you. You're not going to get past that verification phase. Uh, but if you actually can complete all these 15 bullet points and you know deep down in your heart that you actually can do all the things that are listed here, you should not be worrying about your about passing this class. You should just be thinking about the application objectives at that point. Because it's my job to find out that you've completed all 15 of these bullet points. And I'll give you plenty of opportunities to prove that to me. So with the goal of you focus on your education and your learning and your ability to actually do these things, I'll worry about finding out if you can do those things or not. That's my job is to actually make sure that you can do those, or actually check and assess if you can do those. Lord and Savior, that's me. That code nine times wrong because of wrong JDK. And we're starting to, oh yeah, that, that I let, said that one last thing about the syllabus. I'm going to start collapsing these. If you click on any of these headers, by the way, I've had students at the end of last semester didn't realize you could do this yet, so figured I'd show off that feature. Total score one is good. So there's actually no scores in this course. I Everything in Autolab is either going to be one or zero, and sometimes I'll do like 0.1 or 0 0.01 or something like that. Uh, those numbers are strictly nominal. One just means you've completed that thing. Zero means you, anything else means you haven't completed it. And sometimes I'll use something like 0.1 just so I can sort the grades and figure out where the class stands. Like for the homework assignments, I'll do 0.1 to mean that you've completed one of the sub-objectives of the assignment. But the 1.0 is the only thing that says you've absolutely completed everything Autolab has to offer. So the scores don't actually mean anything. 1.0 just means you've finished. You're done with that whatever it is, that thing. How long has that been a feature? A uh, few years. It's So there's a new feature as of last semester where if you collapse it and revisit the page, it stays collapsed. Uh, but being able to collapse these has been a feature since I've built this formatting for my websites. Uh, what was I doing? Oh, and if you're having trouble... If you're having trouble, I got to be careful with Piazza. I don't think it says anything on here, right? How do I, there we go. I got to be careful with Piazza because even though you're, you're anonymous on Piazza, but only to your classmates, my interface still shows all your names. So I have to be careful opening this, but this is a safe post to show. Uh, we're starting to get the office hours posted. Well, not not a lot. I'll have to send out a reminder to my TAs. Any TAs listening, feel free to hit the Slack up. 
with a reminder. But we're starting to get the office hours. If you're having trouble with IntelliJ setup is, is the big issue right now. That and um, a few things with the first lecture question, N not having the else statement, like I mentioned, uh, returning unit, a few different things. But uh, but if you're having trouble getting IntelliJ set up, make sure you visit one of us in office hours. Check us out and uh, get that straightened out. Share your screen with us. We can walk you right through how to get that set up. Looks like we don't have office hours for a little bit here. But Monday morning is your next office hour. You talk to Snigda and get your stuff straightened out. Jacob later in the day and etc. cetera. Uh, and we're at go time, so let's do this. Oh, and I got this question a few times, so I decided to make it super clear. Click on this icon to download the slides. I won't put that the arrow there every time, but that's where the slides are. I call it the presentation icon for those of you who would ask. If you're wondering, that's what I call the presentation icon. So let's get these slides downloaded. These are still getting their schedules finalized. I mean, that's why my office hours aren't up yet either, because I'm getting my schedule finalized, seeing where all my meetings are going to be, etc. Because uh, my office hours aren't even posted yet. So, which uh, I'm thinking late on Thursdays for my office hours. If anybody wants to uh, to get an idea of when they're going to be. What OS am I running right now? Windows, but I usually use Mac. So my laptop is a Mac, but I'm using a Windows machine because it's better at processing all the video for streaming. I got a, a better graphics card in this thing. Saw History of the Internet Part 2, same chill vibe. and I mean, I'm the same person. My lectures are going to have the same vibe. I'm not going to change everything about me just because it's a different class. The only thing I changed was I put my face on the uh, different corner of the screen. <laughs> That's about it. But uh, And I was presenting slides that were collaboratively made instead of my own slides. All right, but with that, we're already two minutes in, so let's do this. We got quite a bit to get through today. We got um, a lot of the rest of 115, uh, except some of the security concepts, the networking concepts from modules three and four, but most of one and two, the rest of one and two, we're gonna finish today in Scala. So it's gonna be a lot of content really fast, but most of it's just syntax. It's not, difficult material but it will take you some time on your own to study but unfortunately with syntax there's nothing i can say i can't just word it differently to get you to understand it better so i'm going to go pretty quick through it uh lecture question today in a package named lecture one of the issues i saw one of the common issues with wednesday's lecture question this is a lowercase l make sure that's lowercase l on your package name capital l on your object name Cap, uh, upper camel case, we call this, starts with a capital and then every new word is capitalized. And then lower camel case on your method names. These are all standard naming conventions that you'll see throughout your careers. Start with the lower case and each new word is uppercase. Whenever I have a lecture question where there's very specific names, I'll put the specific names in quotes. And what I recommend is to cut and paste them directly just to make sure that you don't have any... Uh, any discrepancies in your naming. Naming is one of those really frustrating problems to have because it's hard to find the issue. Autolab is just going to say, hey, this is wrong. Um, but once you find the issue, it has nothing to do with your actual learning of the concepts of the course. It has nothing to do with your learning objectives. It's just a frustrating thing to have. So make sure you have all those. Just cut and paste them. That's the one way to make sure that you don't have a misspelling. Or, which has happened in the past, if I have a misspelling, in my lecture question, you have to maintain that same misspelling because I misspelled it the same way in Autolab as well. So in those cases, make sure you misspell it correctly, as weird as that sounds. Anyway, this method, given a file name that's going to have data in this format with numbers on each line, each number in a line separated by a hashtag or a pound sign or a number sign, depending on what you call the symbol, the numbers will all be integer values they can be negative. You can assume the file exists and is properly formatted. And, oh, this is, uh, uh, this 10 is actually on this line up here. I have my slide a little off there. Uh, this 10 is over here on this line. I resized this box, and when I did, that 10 went, uh, went off there. But a line can't end in a pound symbol like this. 
there will be an integer after that. That's what I mean by properly formatted. Anyway, you can assume the file exists, is properly formatted. What I want is the sum of all the values in the file. So we have file IO, we have reading the lines of the file, we have splitting these lines by a certain delimiter, and then iterating through all the values and summing them all up. So we're gonna have a, a doubly nested loop and file IO, data, uh, I guess not really data structures, uh, but quite a bit going on in this thing. So let's learn how to do all of those things so we can complete this lecture question, which combines all those concepts, all those 115 concepts. We're pretty much doing the accumulator pattern here uh, with some file IO. So before we get into that, let's talk about some more types. We talked about Scala being strongly typed on Wednesday, meaning that we have to specify our types of our variables, of our method parameters, of our method return types. All the types have to be known, have to be uh, not always explicit, but they have to be consistent. And the compiler will check for this consistency. And if anything's off with the types, for example, a method that uh, the return type is a double, and you try returning a string, that's going to be an error and your code will not run. Where in Python and JavaScript, the code will still run, you'll just have the wrong type, the, a type that you're not quite expecting, but it'll let you do that. Scala will not, you have to have your types be consistent. So let's talk about a few of these. We, you've seen these types before, but I wanna go just a little bit more in depth with each type. Each, um, uh, each course, I shouldn't say each course, but some later courses are going to go even more in depth in these. 220 is going to explain how ints and doubles, etc., are represented in memory in a lot more detail than I'm doing here. Uh, so let's peel back one more layer and see what an int is right now. So an int, as you know, is a whole number. It doesn't have any decimal portion. This is the same as a Python int. Similar, except this is a 32-bit representation. So you can only represent numbers that can be represented in 32 bits. One, this is a signed integer value. So one bit is used for the signed bit to denote positive or negative. The other 31 bits are used to denote the number itself. So, um, so we can go up to 31 or two to the 31 minus one is this number here. That's the maximum value that an int can hold. And if you go outside of the range for an int, it will overflow, meaning it won't throw any errors. Nothing will crash. Everything will be keep on going, but you're going to wrap around to the next value in the range. So if I'm at the maximum value and I add one to that value, I'm going to be at the minimum value, which probably isn't what you're expecting your program to do. That's not the value you're going to expect or that you're going to want for that. Uh, can you use unsigned ints um, and also the next value long? You, you can in your programs, you can use whatever types you want. But whenever I have a lecture question or an objective on a homework assignment or anything that's going to be sent to Autolab, you have to follow the types that are specified in that assignment. So if I say write a method that returns an int, you have to return an int. You can't return a long or an unsigned int. Those types exist. You can use them. But make sure you're being consistent with the, um, with the assignment because my assignment code is going to have some test code that's going to expect an int in that example. And if it's expecting an int and you're returning an unsigned int, uh, then my grading code is gonna crash and Autolab is gonna give you a zero because the types don't match. So if I'm trying to say um, val x of type int equals the return of your method, that's going to crash, it won't compile. It won't even crash, it won't compile, it won't even run. Uh, so just be aware of that. You can use any types you want, except when they're specified by the assignment. So a long is just like an int, except it's a 64-bit representation. So now we can represent much larger numbers. If you expect your values to overflow an int to go over this 2.1 billion, uh, right, I, I'm sure, but I have to double check. 2.1, um, yeah, billion. I don't know why I hesitate on that. I know that. Uh, if you expect your values to go over that, swap it out with a long, use the long uh, instead of an int. It's everything that an int does except 64 bits instead of 32. So now if we're at the max value for an int and add one, we're fine. But if we were at this max value for a long and added one, we would still wrap around. We'd still have the overflow. But this is a much larger number that uh, 
in most of your cases, you're not going to hit, depending on what you're doing with these int values. Uh, with integers, uh, including longs, I'll typically use ints in the class. The numbers we're working with won't have much fear of overflowing an int. But, uh, uh, but with ints, one thing we have to be very aware of is integer division. If you divide two ints, Scala will treat this as integer division instead of floating point division. What that means is any remainder is deleted. So if I have two, 245 divided by 12, that's going to equal 20. Because the answer is going to be 20, uh, 20 with a remainder of 5. It's not going to convert that remainder into a decimal because these are both ints. If you have an int divided by an int, Scala will return an int. So it has to do something with that remainder uh, to be able to convert this to an int. And it will not round. It will take the floor. So if I have some division that where the answer is going to be 20.9999999999 forever, the answer is, or I shouldn't say forever because that actually equals 21, but a bunch of nines. If it's integer division, the answer is going to be 20, and you're going to be off by a full whole number. So be cautious of this. This is a big trap for beginning programmers if you're accidentally having integer division. This isn't something you had to worry about in JavaScript. And in Python, I uh, I believe Python 3 is good about avoiding integer division. But now that we have strong types, an int divided by an int is going to return an int. And it's going to cause integer division. Be very cautious of this. One of the easiest ways to get around this is declare, even though you expect these to be integer values, declare one of them as a double, and then you won't have integer division. If you have an integer divided by a double, or a double divided by an integer, it will not be integer division, and you will get a double in return. So doubles, these are our floating point precision numbers. There are also floats, which are the 32-bit versions of this, which um, which I don't even mention in, in this course. We can just use doubles. Uh, so, which I don't know why. I don't know why I use doubles and ints instead of long and double. I think it's just the way that I was taught, so I stuck with it. Um, but a double is a 64-bit floating representation. The way doubles are represented in memory is we have 52 bits to represent the value of the number itself, and then 11 bits to represent the exponent of the number. And doubles are written in what you can think of as scientific notation. It's effectively the same thing. Oh, and one bit for the sign. Effectively scientific notation. So this fraction is going to be like one point something. And then the exponent is going to say how many bits should we shift this value to get the representation that we need. The most important thing you need to know about doubles, besides that they can have decimal portions, is that there has to be some rounding. So since we have a limited number of bits, we have to lose some precision. Where integers and longs said, you know what, here's the range of values I can represent. Don't go outside that range or you're screwed. Double says you can represent pretty much anything. You can represent huge, huge numbers with doubles or very, very small numbers, very small fractions and, and things like that but you will lose precision. You won't have the exact number represented as a double in many cases. So for example, one third, if you haven't seen binary before in decimals, if decimals work the same way as whole numbers in binary, if you have a decimal point, the first, uh, the first place is the one halfs place, the one quarters place, then the one eighths place, the one sixteenths place, the one thirty seconds place, so, so on and so forth. Whereas it's the ones, the twos, the fours, the sixteens on the other side, it's just fractions going the other way. So if we have a fraction of one third, you can't represent one third as the sum of fractions of powers of two. You, you, there's no exact representation for that. Uh, actually, I might have misspoke. I, I, this is my example of not being able to represent in base 10. You may, I don't think you can represent in base one, uh, base two. Anyway, not important. What's important is there are values that you cannot represent as the sum of fractions of powers of two. Point one is one of those, is one of those values. You can't represent this as the sum of powers of two. 
it's going to be this value repeating forever and ever and ever and ever. So at some point in memory, the double has to stop writing down bits. It's going to write down, in fact, 52 bits of that and then stop. 52 bits and then stop. Everything else is truncated. That's uh, And it's not going to be represented. It's not going to be reflected in your value. So you can't represent point 0.1 as a double. This value doesn't actually exist exactly in a computer when it's represented by a double in this format, in the IEEE format. So we have to have an approximation. So what this means is if you have this value stored in a double, you don't actually have point 0.1 stored in that double. And sometimes it's not going to affect you. You don't have to think about it. But you have to be aware that you're not always going to get the results you want. So when I multiply that by 3, and you can run this code, it's in the examples repo, you can do this yourself, print that value out, 0 0.1 times 3, you're going to get this trailing 4 way, way at the end. This is what we call a truncation error, since 0 0.1 was truncated, we're going to have this truncation error and not get the exact result that we want. Double got you confused? Yeah, I see talk about the deadlines. Yeah, the soft deadline is tonight. Go watch the previous lectures if you want more explanation on soft deadlines. Uh, uh, so we're not going to have the exact number represented in our doubles. So the implication to us, like, that's fine and good. Okay, that's not exactly 0.3, but it's close enough. Who cares? Uh, and in 115, we're careful to write the assignments in such ways that this won't affect you, that you won't be burned by, by this. In 116, I'm going to write some assignments that are specifically designed so that if you're not paying attention to this, you're not going to complete the assignment. You're not going to get the correct results. Uh, why is this? So once we're comparing doubles, if we're comparing doubles with equality and checking, is this double equal what I expect it to be? This is where you can get into trouble. So I expect this to be 0 0.3. I set up my math, everything looks fine. If you gave this to a beginning programmer who didn't know anything about uh, doubles being truncated and said, look, Scala is broken because this is returning false, they're gonna have no idea what's going on. Everything looks perfectly fine here, but we're getting that truncation error and this is going to be false. C, which is 0 0.1 times three, does not equal 0 0.3. They are not the same values. They're not equal. This is going to return false. So if this is in a conditional, if you're saying if C equal equal expected, do this, else do this, you're going to hit your else. And your code might completely break if you're doing this. Instead, what we do to get around this is we compare those values to some very small value, which we typically call epsilon. Some very small value that's just big enough to be able to address any truncation errors, but not large enough to affect any of the logic of our program. So now instead of saying, are these two values equal? We're going to say, are they within epsilon of each other? So if we subtract them, we take one of the values, subtract it with the other one. We don't care which way the subtraction goes. Actually, this should be expected, but 0.3 is fine. Uh, C minus expected or expected minus C. Subtract them and then take the absolute value. So if you reverse the order of the subtraction, you're going to get the same value, but it's going to be negated. So if we take the absolute value, we don't have to think about which direction the subtraction is going in. So we take the absolute value of the difference, which is going to be the magnitude of the difference of these two numbers, and then check if that's less than epsilon. If that's less than some very small value, we're going to say that those two doubles are close enough that they're equal within truncation errors. We don't care about truncation errors. So we're gonna consider these two doubles to be equivalent, even though they're not exactly the same. We're going to give it, give it that wiggle room just to take care of the truncation errors. And this is going to resolve to true because they're within this very small value of each other. I recommend the ultimate edition. That'll come into play when we get to the project at the end of the semesters semester. The Ultimate Edition has some web functionality. It'll handle your JavaScript code as well as Scala. That's why I say everyone get the Ultimate Edition. It's going to make the end of the semester easier for you. Uh, a few other types. These are um, not as much to talk about this. Boolean, true or false. You've seen Booleans before. It's no different in this language. Lowercase t and f for what it's worth. 
Uh, so it's more of the JavaScript convention, not the Python convention, where it's capital T, capital F, for what it's worth. But with an ID, if you capitalize them, it's going to tell you you're wrong, and then you're going to lowercase it. So it's not something we have to memorize anyway. Uh, unit is a little bit new. It simply means nothing. This should not return anything. So if I say, and this is typically just used for return types of methods. If a method doesn't return anything, you don't expect any return value, hit it with a return type of unit. And you can see this in the main method. A main method returns unit because we don't expect main to return anything. That doesn't really make sense. Main is made to run the program. So unit, this method, this function, if we have one, we have functions. Actually, your function should always return something. But uh, they could return unit, but... Um, but if your method returns nothing, unit. Uh, print line is another example. Print line returns unit. Print line, we don't care if it returns anything. We want it to call it for the side effect of printing something to the screen. Uh, and yes, this is the same as void. If you've seen void in C++ or Java, uh, this is the same idea. But, you know, the Scala designers decided to call it unit. I'm sure there's a really good explanation of why it's not called void. But uh, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. And, and finally, strings. It's a sequence of characters. Strings actually are data structures. In, uh, I, I'll say most, but it might be all uh, programming languages. Strings are sequences of characters so it's a data structure it's a sequential data structure that holds uh, different characters so there's never an actual um, base type of string it's a more of a compound type or a class in our case here which is a sequence of characters so uh, things we can do with that is iterate over those characters and uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to examples later it's going to be harder to explain from this slide. Uh, they're declared with double quotes. You cannot use single quotes in Scala. So that's a luxury that goes away um, now that we're moving away from Python and JavaScript. We have to use double quotes. So if you want a double quote within your string literal, you have to escape it with a backslash. So double quotes, call it a uh, make a value of type string, and we can play with strings. A lot of how you've worked with strings uh, up until this point. We have a lot of methods to work with strings. The One of the links on the course website on the schedule it gives a reference to all of the methods within a string. A couple that I highlight here starts with some other string. Check if this string starts with this other sequence of characters. The length of the string, give me how many characters the string contains. And split, which we'll see, which is important for your lecture question. Split on some substring, on some other string. Split this string into an array of strings with this uh, based on this delimiter. This works the same way that you would expect from Python and JavaScript when you split strings in there. It's even named the same thing, behaves the same way. So not too much to learn here except the syntax and what to do with the return value of that, which we'll see in an example as well. Is there a char type in Scala? Yeah, I didn't mention it explicitly here, but yes, there is a char. And that's the one time where we can use single quotes. If we have a uh, val c ch of type char equals and then some character, we would use single quotes and then give it the single character that we want to be assigned to that char. And we can convert between these types. And this is important in Scala because we have strong typing that if I have a, um, say I have one method that needs a certain type and another method that returns a certain type, those types aren't the same, uh, but I need to call one method uh, with the return value of the other, for example. The types have to be consistent, so we might have to do some conversion. Scala gives us these nice two methods. If we say two, and then the type that we want to convert it to, as long as the conversion makes sense, it's Going, Scala is going to have a method for you in general, I should say. So, for example, if I want to convert a string that's a properly formatted double and I want to convert it to a double, I can do that string dot to double with no parentheses. This is a method call, but we can leave off the parentheses in some Scala method calls. 
I don't really recommend it, but I wanted to show it off right here. Uh, but we call the to double method, and that's going to return a double representing that string. In this case, if the string can't be converted to a double, like if I, it was the literal string S I X P O and uh, I N T T H E R E, like 6.3 all spelled out, this is going to crash because it can't convert that to a double. It'll crash your program. So use, use these with caution. Make sure you have the proper formatting which is why the lecture question says you can assume it's all properly formatted. If I want to convert an int or a double to a string or any other value, to string, everything is going to have a to string method. Uh, those of you coming from Java are, are aware of that, familiar with that. Everything has a to string no matter what type it is. You can always convert anything to a string. So to string, uh, if I have a double and I want to convert it to an int, to int, this will do the same thing as integer division. So if you have a double, you want to convert it to an int, you are going to lose all of the decimal portion. So it's 5.8 that we're converting to an int. We take a double, 5 equals 5.8, 5 5.8.2 5 .8 int is going to be 5. It's just going to erase the decimal portion. So you have to be careful with this. You are losing some precision. You have to be aware and of what that's doing and make sure it is what you actually want it to do and what you expect it to do. So, and one big caution with this, for example, if you have doubles and you have a truncation error, the one we saw earlier was 0 0.3000000 whatever 4. But what if you had a truncation error where you expected this value to be 6, but instead you had 5.9999999998 or something like that, and then you convert it to an int? You're not going to get the 6 that you're expecting. You're going to get 5 because it's going to erase the decimal portion. So just be aware of that when you're going from doubles to ints for whatever reason. Typically, you just shouldn't. Um, but if you have to, when those cases where it is called for, you'll want to round the double first. Double does have a round method and then convert it to an int. You'll get away from those truncation methods, uh, truncation errors. <laughs> Not seeing the parentheses is going to bother you. I think I usually add the parentheses just in this slide. And I should have them here with the first time I'm introducing these. Why did I do that? Uh, that is convention in Scala to leave them off on certain methods. These ones included. But, uh, but I will have the parentheses later on. So with that, let's pause just for a second here. Uh, I'll catch up on chat. Does anybody have any questions on... These basic types that we're going to be using, int, double, boolean, string, unit, and uh, and the conversions between them. Let's get flush any questions out, give you all a chance to catch, uh, catch your breaths, get this sink in, and then we'll move on. Yeah, in Java you had to do, yeah, integer.parsint. Maybe it's cleaner now, maybe they have a new method, but... It's that or new integer and give it the string will also work in Java. Why do I remember that? I haven't done Java in years. Um, in... Yeah, in Java, you have to have your parentheses or it won't compile. can't have the return wait and assign parameter to be a string I can't have the return so when I define a new method and assign the parameter to be string I can't have the return be an it yeah you can yeah the the return doesn't type doesn't have to match the input type I'm just saying if you have one type and you need another type that's where you'd use the conversion methods is what I was saying earlier but you certainly can I can have a I mean this method right here takes an array of strings and returns unit we can have different types and yesterday we saw one that, uh, what, what did it take? It took a double and returned a string to say whether the value was large, medium, or small. We took a double and returned a string yesterday, um, not yesterday, Wednesday. So I heard that type conversions on numbers isn't good practice. Postgres using string val long instead of int. Uh, usually don't want to convert. Like converting from a double to uh, an int 
isn't the best thing to do. Unless it's really what you need. Sometimes I do that and I actually do it with the two int. If I have a, an integer based grid system, but I also have a location on that grid system that's a, a floating point value, and I want to know which cell is um, contains that point, like a, a player location on a grid system where a player has free full free movement. That's one example where I'd want to convert a double to an int, and I don't want any of the decimal portion. I want that to go away uh, without rounding. Because you know, if you're in the very top corner of that grid, I want it to be the actual coordinate. Uh, but with that, how should we test our code? For so for now, until Monday, where I introduce unit testing, you, to test your lecture question code, write a main method and call your method in main, print the value to the screen, and then just check manually if it's printing out the right values that you expect. Uh, oh, with the file. Actually, that's the demo that I have later, uh, where I'll go to IntelliJ and show you how to set up a file for testing. But let me keep on pressing on so we can get to that. For loop. So for loop, the structure is very similar to what you've seen last semester. There, oh, I should have double checked on this. I'm like 95% sure there's no standard, whatever you call a standard for loop, what I call a standard for loop anyway. In, uh, in Scala, there's only for each loops, which you should be familiar with from Python and JavaScript anyway, unless you transferred in and you took C++. There's no... A three statement for loop where you would have an initialization a conditional and the incrementation uh, we don't have that but we do have for each loops we have some variable that we're going to create and name which is our looping variable and that loops over a data structure with different values in it and the loop is going to iterate over the data structure and assign each element from the data structure to this variable and run the body of the loop for each of those values in that data structure. That's why we call it a for each loop. For each thing in this data structure, do something. So if we want to simulate what what I refer to at least as a standard for loop, because uh, that's the only loop that we used to have. For each loops are newer, you know, newish in the past 20 years or so at least. Um, uh, but we lived a long time without for each loops. But anyway, if you want to simulate the standard loop, we have this one, two, n method. The two, two is a method that takes two values, one and n. The syntax is a little strange in this. Um, but, uh, uh, but this is going to give us a data structure with all the values from one to this value that we specify here. So if I call this method with the value 10 and where n is going to get the value 10 i'm iterating for i in 1 to 10 and this is going to execute for each value 1 to 10 and i'm going to get this output over here i is going to be assigned 1 print i is going to be assigned 2 print i is going to be assigned 3 etc and it includes the end point this will include 10. this method 2 one to n actually does return a data structure this is a data structure so just to emphasize that if i put one to n here i can store that data structure in a value it's actually a data structure of type range i can store that in a value or a variable if i wanted to if i expected it to change and then iterate over that data structure the same way that we would any other data structure yeah the so scala likes its arrows the arrow here the less than dash this is an arrow, which is read as in. So this data structure, you can think of this as the values, what direction the values are going. The values in this data structure are going this way. These values are being assigned to this va uh, value, uh, this named value, and then this loop is running for each of those. And you'll see this a few times when we talk about first order functions, we will see more arrows. Um, the developers of Scala like their arrows and I ain't complaining, I like them too. Makes things a little, I think a little clearer. If we're looping over a data structure, it works the same way. 
for some variable name in this data structure do these things. So let's look at an example that combines a lot of the things that we've just seen, combines a lot of the syntax so we can see how uh, how everything works. Am I safe? Man, that's ominous. Why Are you outside my house? I, I think I'm safe. Uh, oh, someone breaking into my garage. Oh, yeah. The the door is for some reason in this specific room is very loud the garage is right below me so unfortunately when they do the whenever someone opens the garage door uh i, I was hoping you wouldn't be able to hear it but no it's i'm fine as far as i know i'm fine uh so let's write a program let's go through this example write a program that given a string which contains Boolean values separated by semicolons return the percentage of the values that are true. So given some string like this, where I have Boolean values just as a string separated by semicolons, I want to know the percentage that are true. So in this example, 80% of the values are true, 20% is false. So this should return 0 0.8 uh, for the percentage as a decimal. Uh, since I do percent, I probably should multiply that by 100 down here and have it return 80, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, we're not we're not focusing on probability and math right now, I guess. But, uh, uh, but let's see how to do this. So we're going to call this method that I wrote to solve the, that problem. So this is an example, going back to the question, blink twice if you need help. I don't need help. Uh, the, so if this were the question, this is what you would write. And then you to test, at least for now, until Monday, when I'll, I'll start emphasizing unit testing and emphasize it throughout the rest of the semester, we're going to write a main method, write a main method, set up some input, call your method, and then print it to the screen and see if it's right. And, um, and I'll give an example of doing that with a file, uh, an input file as well. So first, when we call this method that takes in that line in the right format, and we're expected to return a double, we're going to split that line on our delimiter, in this case, semicolons. Take the line, split it on semicolons. That's going to return an array of strings, which we haven't talked about data structures yet, but we will um, we will briefly today. I want to get to the demo. So an array of strings. The, what, the important thing to know right now is that that is a data structure, so we can iterate over it with our for each loop. I'm going to initialize my counts. I'm going to count the, there are a bunch of different ways you could do this. I'm sure you would come up with a different answer if you were to do this, but I'm going to initialize two values, uh, two variables, the total count, the number of values that I've seen, and the true count, how many of those values were true. And I'm going to declare both of these as doubles, even though they're always going to be whole numbers, I'm going to declare those as doubles because I know I want to divide them later and I don't want to get integer division. I don't want integer division biting me in this code. So I'm just going to declare them as doubles and not worry about the integer division. That's just one way that we can handle this. We could also declare them as ints and then do that to double on at least one of them down here. A lot of different ways we could handle that issue, but that's how I'm going to do it. Then I'm going to iterate over the values that I split. So when the line is this and I split on semicolons, this array is going to have the values true, false, true, true, true. So I'm executing this loop five times, once for each of these values. The values I'm going to assume are properly formatted as strings, but they are strings here. I have an array of string, so value is of type string. But I want to check its Boolean value. So I'm going to convert it to a Boolean, store it as a Boolean value, declare this value, value as Boolean, of type Boolean, convert the string to a Boolean, now I have that value as a Boolean. If that Boolean is true, and this is a, a beginner thing that I see all the time, you would say value as Boolean equal equal true. Uh, well, it's already a Boolean. It's already a Boolean expression by nature. So I can just say if. So if this is true, this is going to be executed. If this is false, this will be executed. So if it's, or sorry, I have no else. If it's true, this will be executed. So if this is true, I'm going to increment my true count by one. And whether it's true or false, I don't have an else here. No matter what, I'm going to increment my total count because I saw another thing. Uh, you know, some of you might do this differently. Var total count uh, of type double equals splits dot length 
perfectly valid. This is just the way I decided to do it. Uh, increment my count, so I already talked about that. And then finally return the division. Since these are doubles, I'm not going to get integer division. I am going to preserve that floating point value. If we declared these as ints and then did this division, got integer division, this method is only ever going to return 0 or 1. 1 if all the values are true and 0 out on every other input. So 0 0.8, this would be deleted. We'd only get the 0 portion if we had integer division. So avoid that when it's pertinent. So let's talk about reading files. Reading files that luckily is pretty simple in in um, Scala. It was pretty simple in Python as well, in my opinion. We're going to use source dot from file. This method built into Scala is going to take a file name and give us a data structure, not a data structure, but a buffered source that we can get a data structure out of containing all the lines and then iterate over those lines. When you uh, so this program is going to take a file in the directory data slash test file that txt. It's going to take that file, read it, and then just print it to the screen. And But we're going to assume that file does exist. If that file doesn't exist, when we try to open the file, we're going to get a file not found error. Yeah, the plus equals, this is the same as writing equals content equals contents plus than whatever I have. Plus equals is a shorthand. Uh, to represent that. This is something we don't like talking about in 115 because it causes some uh, causes some specific issues. But in 116 we're going to start using some fancier syntax. So one of the new things here, we are going to have our first import statement. So we need to use code that is not found in this file and isn't automatically imported. A few things are automatically imported. We used math.abs earlier without importing it. The math object is always automatically imported in any Scala program. Uh, and a few other things like print line, we didn't have to import. The things that Scala decides, the developers decided that everybody's going to need in every program. They're just always there. Not every program, but you know what I mean. Uh, some things that are less common, like source. Not every program reads files from the hard drive. So this is going to be imported. Import Scala IO source for this. If you just type source dot from file, file name or whatever, IntelliJ is going to be like, whoa, 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 you didn't import source. And then it's going to have a quick, easy way for you to just import it. And it's going to do that for you. Be a little careful with that. If you have class, something that you're importing, um, where there's two different classes and different packages with the same name, you might end up with the wrong one. So be a little cautious with that. Uh, but for the most part, you don't have to remember where exactly your package lives. So we're going to import that. Now we're able to use source in our code, which is great because we need that. We're going to use the from file method of the source object to be able to open our file. That's going to give us a buffered source, which gives us a way to read that file from, uh, from the hard drive. It has a lot of functionality. Buffered source is very powerful, can do a lot of stuff. We're going to skip most of its power and just call it get lines. Get lines is going to give us a data structure or at least an iteratable value uh, of strings. One string, uh, each line represented as a different string in this data structure. And we're going to iterate over those lines. And finally, whatever we need to do with each line. So we're going to call source.fromfile with the file name, get that buffered source called get lines, iterate over the lines, and now we have a loop that executes once per line of the file. So this is how we're gonna open text files in Scala. Uh, the get lines, um, once you start opening very large files, you don't wanna use get lines anymore. You'll wanna actually use the buffered functionality of this buffered source. Get lines is gonna load everything into RAM at once. So if you're opening like a 10 gig file, get lines isn't gonna work for you because uh, it won't fit in your RAM. But for our purposes in this course, get lines is going to work just plenty, uh, just fine for us. Why do we add the slash n? Uh, get lines is going to remove the new line characters. So unlike Python, which preserved the new lines, uh, Scala is going to remove the new lines. This is like taking the entire file and saying dot split on new line characters. 
So I just added them back in. I'm just recreating the contents of the file in a variable, which uh, just for the sake of example, I'm not really doing anything meaningful here. I'm just showing you how to open a file and iterate over its lines. Oh, thank yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I forgot that uh, I forgot to update my slides. I do need since I so if I just do for line in source dot from file of file name dot get lines all right here, this code runs fine. Uh, but since I modified it to show that this is returning a buffered source, I just broke this apart so it shows um, what's happening step by step here. Since I have a value of type buffered source. You also have to import buffered source. So you would have your braces, an open brace, comma, buffered source as well, and then a closed brace. That's what this should be to, no, thanks for pointing that out. That's what this should be to be able to run. This, as it's shown, won't actually run without importing the buffered source as well. I, th I believe that's fixed in the repo, but I forgot to update the slide. Okay. Now let's get to that. Example. Oh, IntelliJ is already open. Okay. Uh, so, what I want to show, and this is what it's supposed to be. So what I want to show is how to test this uh, this code. The most important thing that I'm going to repeat a few times here is that the path for the file is from the root of your project, not the source's root. So what do I mean by that? When I say file val file name equals data slash test file dot txt, I have to go not to the source folder but all the way up to my root of my project, this directory is where this program is ran from. So start in this directory, then look for a directory named data, and then look for, hey, I have a lot of stuff, then look for a file named test file. That's the file that's going to be read. So for your assignment, uh, create a file, put it somewhere relative and uh, put it somewhere in your project directory and make sure you know where it is relative to your root directory of your project and then create, you know, do a couple of lines. Um, make sure you have at least one negative value in there, etc. Create a, a decent file. Create a file with some content, and then in your code, put that file name in your main method. That file name should not appear anywhere in the method that you write for your code. Put it in your main method, call it with that file, and then run it, and make sure you get the values that you expect. And I didn't. Oh, come on. That's fine. And then we get that exact text from that file that I have. So, So call it in your main method with the file that you create. Make sure you get the value that you expect printed to the screen. Autolab will ignore your main methods. So whatever you have in there, don't worry about it. But your method that you write for your lecture question can't contain your file because in, in all likelihood, my Autolab, I don't have a file with that exact name, with that exact content on my server. Uh, so you're not going to get your grade like that because uh, I have no idea what that file is that you created. It's up to you to create it. So just be aware of that. Be cautious in your method. Always take this file name. Whatever that file name is, use that file name. Use this variable as the file name. Uh, don't hard code this. I see this a lot. Uh, especially er early in the semester. 
don't do this because on my server when this is run on Autolab, Autolab is going to look for this file, which isn't going to exist because I don't have that file on the server. So be aware of that. Uh, and I move around your code like that file won't exist uh, anywhere and it won't have the right values in it that I'm testing for anyway so be aware of that yeah you can so you can have source in your path if you want to put your data in the source folder just make sure you have source in there the dot slash, I'd be cautious of that. Or no, yeah, no, that's fine, actually. Dot slash, uh, you can have a leading dot slash or not. It's going to work the same. Should work the same, I should say. Don't lead with a slash, though. That's the one I want to caution about. Don't lead with a slash. Because that's something very different. And let's talk about some data structures. I'll go through... Oh. We end at 240, don't we? I'm thinking 50 again. Um, I'm, I'm fine not really talking about the data structures too much. I'm mostly talking about syntax. Yeah, 240, that's tripping me up. Uh, I'm mostly talking about syntax here. So feel free to go through these slides on your own. If I have time tomorrow, I might go through these in a little more depth. But let me rip through them really quick right now. I want to talk about three data structures for now, array, list, and map. These are going to parallel the data structures you've already seen. We have two sequential data structures we're talking about, and then one key value store. Array, we saw a little bit. It's going to rep be represented as a continuous block of memory and indexed uh, by their values. Index 0, index 1, index 2, etc. Uh, here's some of the syntax. We can assign a value. We can retrieve a value both by index, iterate over the things, over the elements or iterate over the indices in a couple different ways. We can use the two method that we've seen or just use array.indices. List is non-continuous in memory. It jumps around memory a lot. So there's no notion of indices that we sometimes pretend there are. If I have a list of values, the order is preserved. Uh, and if I want the first value, I'm gonna, uh, that's called the head of the list. For any other value, we can pretend they have indices with the apply method. This is going to pretend to get the value at index 1, uh, which would be the 3. Um, much, much more about that later when we talked about linked lists later in the semester. If I want to append to the end of a list, this is the method. This is the syntax for it. If I want to prepend to the beginning of the list, this is the syntax for that. Each time, this creates a new list with the value appended. So you do have to reassign it to your variable to actually have that change reflected. This does not actually append 50 to the existing list. It creates a new list with all of these values plus 50 appended to it. So you have to reassign that or else your change will not be reflected. This is a big trap. This is a big, not a trap, I shouldn't say, should say. But this is something that we are going to get a lot in office hours and in Piazza. That's going to be one of the big mistakes that we're going to see. Don't be one of those people. Don't make that mistake. It takes a while to get used to that, but that must happen. You must reassign back. Uh, it's kind of like modifying a string. You have to reassign it back to the string. And then iteration, pretty simple, the basic structure for a loop. And finally, our key value store, a little bit different syntax. We're going to see some arrows. We're mapping values to, or keys to values. The arrow is kind of like the mapping to method. Two maps to four, three maps to nine, four maps to 16. If I want to add a key value pair, same syntax, but we use the plus sign and again reassign back. If I want to access the value at a key, use parentheses with array. By the way, it was parentheses, not brackets like you might be used to. Parentheses, because these are method calls. The access, this will crash if the key is not there. So to avoid that, I like to use get or else, which is going to get the value at a specific key. And if that key does not exist in the map, I'm going to give it a default value. 100 doesn't exist in this map, so it's going to return negative 1 for me. And iteration, we can iterate over keys and values at the same time. So for key and value in my map, using this parenthesis and comma syntax, iterate over both of them at the same time. You can do dot values or dot keys and iterate over one or the other. But when it's this easy to iterate over both, even if you don't need both value, both key and value, why not? Why not iterate over both? Is my opinion anyway. 
And back to the lecture question. All right. So it's a little over. I'll, I'll try to stop going over. I, I got to cut that out. It's too easy when it's online and I don't know. But, uh, but that's the end of lecture content. As always, I'll hang out until 442 starts. Map and dictionary are the same. Yeah, so map is our key value store in Scala. It's just like a dictionary in Python or an object in JavaScript. Not just like, but for most purposes, especially for what you've seen so far, they're effectively the same. Kid or else sounds like a threat to IntelliJ. Yeah. I mean, it might be. Let's not rule anything out. Doesn't Scala have map function in array? Yeah, so map is also a, a method uh, you can use on arrays and lists and many other data structures. If you want to, like, say I wanted to, if I had a list of 2, 3, 4, and I wanted a list of all these values squared, like kind of what I'm doing with the map, uh, you can use the map method. You could say list.map and uh, give it the square function and then get a new list with all the values squared. But that's a different thing than the map data structure. Where's a TA when you need one? There's TAs here. I don't know what that's in reference to, though. So having a problem where a compiler says it can't find the path. Could you show your IntelliJ again? Sure. For a lot of those issues, if you're still having issues setting up IntelliJ, I'd recommend uh, visiting one of us in office hours. Don't spend too much time bashing your head against it. When we can probably fix your problem a lot quicker. So only projects need interviews. The Every learning objective and homework needs an interview. So you, if you're shooting for an A, you'll have a minimum of 11. Are we doing interviews for the final project? I'm undecided if we're doing an interview for the final project or not. Not the final project, but the project contribution. But at least 10 interviews throughout the semester if you're going for an A, which you all should be. What's the difference between array and list? Yeah, I had to gloss over that quite a bit. An array is a continuous block of memory, and a list is mapped all over memory and has references to each value. That will be explained in much more detail when we get to the data structures and algorithms learning objective. So I don't want to, you know, I won't spend too much time on it now, but that's the main difference, and there are a lot of implications of that. An array, for example, is what we call random access. If I want the eighth value in an array, I know exactly where to find that in memory. Since it's all one continuous block of memory, I just jump ahead um, the size of each element times eight, and I get to that element. A list, we have to hop all over memory. The first, uh, the first value might be might be here in memory, the next value might be over here, the next value might be over here, but each value knows where the next value is. So if I want the eighth value in a linked list, I have to jump all around memory and traverse the list to find out where uh, where that value is. That's a short answer. And uh, the advantage to having it all over memory, that might seem inefficient at first. Uh, the advantage is that you can add elements to a list very easily. An array, if you want to add an element to the end of an array, the next value in memory might already be taken by another value or an, even another program. So you would have to recreate the entire array somewhere else in memory, which is expensive. When is lab? The first lab will be next week on Thursday. But the first lab is already released. You can get it done now, and then all you have to worry about is demoing it to your TA. Uh, but the next lab, officially, technically, is next Thursday. Uh, and next week's lab is kind of a different lab than all of the rest. Uh, once the homeworks and uh, interviews and learning objectives start coming in, lab is going to start getting a more consistent feel and will be on Thursdays.
Can you tell me again where I should put my text file? So you can put it wherever you want. The important thing is that wherever you, whatever you put in your code has to match wherever you put your, uh, wherever you put your file. So here my code says data slash test file dot txt. So if I go to my project, my project root, I find the data folder and I look in that folder, I better find a file named testfile.txt. If I don't, then my program's gonna crash. So let's say I misspelled this, my program's gonna crash. It has to be exactly where you put your file. Yeah, why didn't they just name it linked list instead of list? Uh, I don't know, less typing? I don't know. But the Scala list is a linked list. Uh, for those of you new to Autolab, you can submit as many times as you want, just so you know. So submitting twice isn't a big deal. Um, if you submit it in... You know, if it's working on your machine and you submit it and it's not giving you credit, um, I would double check the way you're testing, make sure it is actually right on your computer. Um, if you can't figure it out, make a private post on Piazza with your an explanation of your problem in your code. And the TAs should be able to help you with that. And by the way, I should have a quick PSA. Actually have a meaningful question if you're posting like that on Piazza. Don't just post a screenshot of your code and say, help, I don't know what's wrong. We get that question, that exact question of, help, I don't know what's wrong, way far, far too often. Give us an explanation of what you've tried, what the symptoms are, why you think it's wrong, uh, why you think it should be right. Give us some details, and you're going to get a quicker and better answer in most cases uh, when it's just like help i don't know what's going on the first contact that you get from a ta is probably going to be so what's your actual question what do you what do you want from me and then you got to have a back and forth and then you're eventually going to have to actually ask your question it's just a waste of time for everybody if you have ask your question up front and we can help you better and faster and you'll be happier No, you don't have to interview for every lecture question. One interview per learning objective at a minimum. If you pass all those interviews, that's a total of five interviews. If you, uh, if you need to re-interview for any of them, obviously that's going to be more interviews. But, you're, but not for every lecture question for each learning objective. For example, the first... Uh, Got to find my mouse. So the first time you have one of those interviews is week four. Week four's lab on Thursday is going to be about the program execution learning objective. And you'll have two hours to finish uh, effectively a quiz on it. You'll have questions about reading code, uh, some conceptual questions, etc. to really assess your code reading ability. And you'll also, on top of that, have to schedule an interview with a TA a, a TA will reach out to you, schedule an interview with that TA during this week, and get that interview done as well. So there are two parts to that, but those that learning objective verification happens on specified weeks. Week four, and then every two weeks after that. Object OOP on week six, FP on week eight. You know, you get the idea. Uh, so there will be five rounds of that, for, one for each learning objective. If you don't complete satisfactorily complete the lab or the interview, you'll have more opportunities. Uh, the week after, I'm talking with the TAs. We're looking at making a slight change to the, some of the structure. I'm not sure what we're going to do with the homework verifications. The homework verification interviews will happen in the weeks that they're specified here. But on Thursdays, uh, we don't really need a homework verification lab. So we're thinking of just doing make up um, learning objective verifications on these weeks, which is most likely what we're going to end up doing. Uh, but the homework verification interview, so you'll interview for a learning objective, you'll interview for a homework verification, you'll interview for 
a learning objective verification. You should have interviews every week for most of the semester once we get rolling, but not for every lecture question. That'd be excessive. That'd be insane. It'd also be good. It'd be beneficial for your learning, for your education, but we just don't have the TA hours to be able to do that. And the scheduling, oh my goodness, it'd be a lot. And that'd be something that would actually be easier to do if we were in person, but uh, I don't know, it'd be a bit excessive still. Where do you find the lab assignment? So only one lab assignment is live on the website. This will probably be the only one that's ever posted just up front like this, but the very first lab is posted right here. So you can go through the whole thing and see what you got to do. The rest, week three, uh, we probably will have a pre-homework for that. And then it gets into learning objective verifications after that. So I won't post anything for the learning objective verification. But once you start the lab on Thursday, you'll get the quiz. And you'll have to schedule an interview as well. Can I submit Autolab before lecture start? Yeah, as soon as I post the lecture questions, feel free to submit. You don't have to wait till lecture starts. You have the lecture question. Uh, I gave this warning earlier uh if you are going ahead um let me think about that how to word this one if you're going ahead make sure that the lecture question is posted on autolab before you start working on the question you don't really have to do that but before i post the lecture questions on autolab with the graders the lecture question is fair game to be changed so I might change this lecture question, for example, before I post the grader. But once I post the grader on Autolab, the lecture question won't change anymore. And there are quite a few lecture questions that I want to change this semester. Some of these first ones, I mean, there's not much else I can do. Your intro to unit testing, there's not much I can improve on that one. It's This is writing a unit test for Wednesday's lecture question. Uh, how do we test that? I don't see any reason to change that one. But like... One six. I don't like this question at all. Um, so I want to change this one up. This one just causes students all kinds of headaches. And uh, I don't know. It, it needs to be changed. And there are quite a few throughout the semester that I just need to update. Cause a lot of undue stress on students. For lecture question, do I need to separate the text into separate lines using get lines? You can use any method you want, but I I mean I recommend get lines just because um, I guess I don't technically recommend it, but but that's the one that you know how to use if you watch the lecture and paid attention. So why not? If you have another way, if you have experience and you want to do it a different way, you want to actually use the buffered nature of the buffered reader, by all means go for it. 